I think that's probably what it comes down to in the end, you know, is that human sort of factor. But you miss that feeling of connection to the song when you have a song that's so perfect and like digitally made. It could be a top charting song, but how much are people really connecting to it and going back to it after it's kind of had its moment? Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Well, folks, it's our 100th episode. It took us two years, but we did it. I don't know why the number 100 seems like such a milestone. But perhaps it's because it takes so much work to record and produce a single episode. Or maybe it's that I've been working with Jason Moore, my producer and editor, cranking these episodes out week after week for two years straight, with no breaks and no hiatus. Whatever the reason, it's a big day for me, Jason, and the podcast. And we couldn't have reached this milestone without you, the Dream Path listeners. So thank you for listening. Thank you for telling your friends about the show. Thank you for following and engaging with us on social media and sharing our posts. Thank you for emailing me with comments and feedback about particular interviews. And thank you for leaving reviews on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to the show. In the next few days, I'll hop on the mic and do a solo cast about Surpassing 100 and what that means to me. So I won't ramble on about it here. We have an interview to get to, and it's a fun one. Today I talked to Carly Rosenthal and Mike Post. Carly is the lead singer of the band Carly in the Universe, an indie soul pop band that I immediately added to my playlist after seeing their music videos on YouTube. You better fucking listen to what I have to say. Mike Post is the lead vocalist, guitarist, and keyboard player for the band Young Creatures. Their music is a bit more cerebral and contemplative, but unique and catchy as well. Mike also has a solo album called The Crunch. Here's a song from that album called In Search of You. And I will bite my tongue and smile As I sit and wait a while Throw another problem on the pile If I can't help it, I'll just smile Carly and Mike are not only accomplished musicians and recording artists, they own and operate Moose Cat Recording Studio in Los Angeles. And even though their work in their respective bands is worthy of an interview on that topic alone, we spent most of our time talking about their approach to recording other artists, what inspired them to get into the recording business, how Moose Cat Recording Studio got started, how they developed expertise in the industry, and what advice they would give to others aspiring to work in this field. At the end of the interview, They invited me down to their studio when the pandemic is over for what sounds like an amazing party that they hold for musicians and industry professionals. So when that happens, I'll plan on doing a follow-up interview with these two face-to-face in their studio. In the meantime, let's jump into my chat with Carly Rosenthal and Mike Post. How's it going? Hey, really, really well this morning. Thank you for joining me. Uh, Carly Rosenthal, Mike Post, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks so much for having having us. us. Yeah, this looks fantastic. I love this backdrop of the, the, we're in the belly of the beast for my listeners who are not watching YouTube and are listening to this on, um, you know, just the normal podcast uh, platform we have in the background, um, this recording studio, Moose Cat recording studio vibe that is um, really kind of um, almost like a retro looking studio you you have a lot of old school feel to this studio so tell us about how this came about how you put it together and what thought you put into it um to make it what it is today yeah um (laughs) we probably put a little bit too much thought into it maybe if that's possible but um we started off, uh, you know, we're both musicians. 
And first and foremost, we wanted to have a rehearsal space and a place to record. And it kind of just turned into something so much bigger and better than what we wanted. Mike's been a producer for over 10 years and I've been a musician for a long time and we just uh we worked with this guy Ken Gores to build the the to build the inside of the studio and get it like completely soundproof and acoustically treated and that was a huge process on its own to learn everything that a studio needs to really dial in a good sound um and yeah and i mean i just uh, i was always working in other studios and always dreamed of having sort of my own place to to uh to work you know for both uh as an artist and also as producer and engineer um so it kind of just came together in sort of the best possible way um i know nothing about any of this stuff back here just just buttons to me (laughs) (laughs) so are are you being serious carly you you are more on the the producing side of things or the business side of the studio or yeah more yeah. on the business side of things okay. uh this the, i had no interest in uh learning what like compression does you know in regards to my work <laughs> i know a little bit more these days but you know nah yeah i couldn't sit here and do all do this, what he does all day <laughs> i probably yeah. have enough interest for the both of us yeah well, I think that's important in any business relationship that you have um, roles and you have lanes that you stay in. Uh, and otherwise, there's no symbiosis. There's If you're both doing the same thing, then there's redundancies and uh, you step on each other's toes. So it, it sounds like you two both have this musical background. And I've, I've listened to your bands, by the way. Oh, um, thanks. Yeah, Carly mm-hmm. and the Universe and... Um, the uh oh gosh i i wrote down the notes here um young, young creature the young creatures band which um has several albums that were uh i mean these are these both of these bands are kind of from my school of music in terms of what i listen to what's in my playlist so it was really fun to go Sweet. through yeah it was, it was hey. fun to go through your catalogs and see the differences and see with carly in the universe you know, more of a pop feel to it, but still that indie soul vibe. And then with Young Creatures, a little more con- uh, contemplative and cerebral. Um, but to to uh, see also the list and the credits of bands that you're recording, I my impression, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but my impression is that you are gravitating toward folks that kind of fit into your musical universe um, and and your vibe. And maybe the reverse is happening too. They're gravitating toward you because they see the, the music that you've been putting out and recording. How do you look at that relationship between the artists that you help record and your own musical tastes? I think it's kind of just a natural thing almost, um, you know, where we we have all types of music here but the stuff that that i gravitate towards like as a as a listener and and also as an artist and producer um sort of just you know it obviously it comes out in the work and i think people recognize that but also the stuff that i get excited about the artists that i get excited about you know have a maybe have a certain sort of uh a certain vibe to them um so maybe not something that necessarily you seek out, but um, some maybe maybe just happens kind of naturally. Like you know, I don't try to push um, into lanes or, or genres that I don't belong. Also, you know, try to make a conscious decision where you know I feel like I can help certain artists uh, more than more so than others, maybe as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, for for example, if like a hip hop artist came to you or maybe um like a death metal band or something like that uh i I would imagine carly from a business standpoint you would want to at least consider that but mike from a recording standpoint in terms of what you can offer and contribute to the equation there might be some some thought that has to go into that before saying yes i would imagine For sure. Yeah, we want it to be the right fit. And, you know, not that we haven't necessarily worked on that type of stuff before. You know, I I love hip hop. 
Um, so I've been getting more into mixing that that honestly, kind of stuff. Honestly, but, when he does do that kind of stuff, it it bridges a gap with uh, like rap music or like even modern pop music to have the hybrid of the analog and the digital and really brings like a nice like, warmth to uh, mm -hmm. those type of projects that come in. So as far as like hip hop projects go, you know, uh, Mike's not producing beats here, but, you know, we are doing live tracking type stuff. So if hip hop artists want to lay down a guitar track on their stuff or a vocal track, um, first and foremost on their track, bringing it here and warming it up and blending it in the mix in a different light can bring a really nice, uh, warmth to, to what they're doing. So, so uh, you you mentioned. So, sorry to interrupt you, Mike. Did you want to finish up a thought? There? Uh, no, I was just gonna say, yeah, that's pretty pretty right on. I mean, I think a lot of people who are working at home, like producing stuff like on their computer, you know, are sort of yearning for um, some sort of real realness uh, to add to their music, whether that's guitar or just you know having some some sort of air moving around in a room rather than just being confined to your to your computer. Yeah. Um so that I yeah, that's definitely a way that we that we uh can sort of add add to somebody's uh musical creation. It's interesting that you you mentioned the analog digital dichotomy or the the two different worlds that people live in. And my look at your studio online and I looked at all your pictures and the equipment, uh it seems to have a very analog vibe. You have the uh the Fender amps these beautiful old school fender amps that i imagine some of them are tube amps um all. and all of them okay and you have these microphones that also have this old school vibe so can you tell the listeners who don't know the difference between digital and analog what that means and also what that means to the listener like when you're listening to music and um trying to discern is this digital or is this analog yeah well i i guess um you know technically speaking um it goes as far as like digital uh being recorded on a computer and analog being recorded on tape um so that's like i guess what we you know the true sort of meaning but uh behind analog and digital but that sort of has sort of come to extend uh beyond that you know when it comes to like you said working with an amp um an analog amp or a tube amp or any sort of amp because uh there are so many like digital recreations now of these of these uh of everything of amps uh where you know somebody's plugging a guitar into a computer and trying to emulate what you get when you have a real analog um you know old school sort of amp um so the, i mean the difference to me uh sometimes it's sort of hard to put your finger on but it's uh i guess in sound uh just a more natural um organic sort of sound uh, overall um that you know again kind of hard to put your finger on it exactly um but so you know when you hear something that's been recorded on tape as opposed to digital um it sort of have has like a breathing sort of real quality to it Mm. Um, where sometimes digital recordings can can come off, you know, a bit stale, and obviously there's all shades in between. Um, but I would just say there, you know, with analog stuff, there's just sort of a realness, realness to it. Um, you know, putting it simply. Yeah, I like the way you mentioned um, air moving through the room because I think that is missing with a digital experience where you plug directly into a computer interface. And you, you really don't have that room, that space for um, perhaps, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, but maybe ambient, some ambient uh, air sounds and also just fingers moving over the, the guitar strings or something like that. If you have it too clean and digital to me seems um, sometimes too clean and perfect then you lose that humanness of the process. So that for me, that's what it means. I'm probably not describing it that well, but as a layperson from the outside looking in, that's what it means to me. 
I think that's probably what it comes down to in the end, you know, is that human sort of factor. But you miss that feeling of connection to the song when you have a song that's so perfect and like digitally made, you know, it could, it could be a top charting song, but how much are people really connecting to it and going back to it after it's kind of had its moment? Right. You know, there's a couple of documentaries I saw recently over the last year. One of them was John Lennon, uh, Above Us Only Sky. And I think that's, that's what it was called, Above Us Only Sky. It was um, about the recording of the um, the solo album, Imagine. And um, there was another documentary on Ed Sheeran where he was in a recording studio. And the whole focus of the documentaries was on what was happening in that studio and that the magic that was occurring the the trial and error the human connections that were being made the the conflicts between the musicians um you know george harrison looking over at john lennon like you know trying to figure out i think he was playing on one of the songs on that that album and he's like you know struggling to figure out what john wants so the reason I'm so intrigued, one of the reasons I'm so intrigued to talk to you both is that you are in that world still. And despite the fact that people have GarageBand on their laptops and they have all of this access to record music themselves, you still have this space for musicians to go to and to have that experience of talking to an engineer and troubleshooting things and creating in this very organic fluid environment so t tell me if you could what that means to you as an artist and as a creative both of you to still have to still be able to hold on to that special experience and space yeah i think what was su super cool about like that I, I saw that documentary too. I mean, just any anytime you see like everybody sort of like crammed into like a space together is like interesting things can happen. Um, you know, it's like the opposite of a sterile environment. You know, it's stuff flying around the room. People are saying stuff, you know, if musicians are interacting with each other, like the band is vibing. Um, it's sort of that unknown factor that could actually really enhance um, and sort of bring on a new character to the recording. Um, so we try to maintain that here uh, where, you know, I always, when I'm working with a band, I, I never want to have a band, you know, recording one at a time. Um, we, we very much actively want to have, you know, multi, you know, if we can have the whole band in here playing together, whether we keep everything or not, you know, it's another question, but um, I think it's important to sort of maintain that human uh, experience, especially when bands are, you know, so used to playing together. And then all, a lot of times they're going into the studio and just recording one by one and it, you know, editing it to bits. Um, you know, it takes away for me and, and it, but it, it is sort of a balance to, you know, um, trying to find that sort of, uh, that spark, um, where musicians are interacting and playing and then also finding, you know, a clean performance to, um, but yeah, we're very much, you know, rooted in, um, sort of that interaction, uh, that can happen with it in a room like, like this. You know, I work, I work with, you know, other producers who make beats for me to sing on. And I also work with Carly in the Universe and, you know, it just more of a love of like the artistry that involved in like working with other people to make something beautiful and as far as you know getting sent a track and then just you know I, I'll write some vocals and one night track it sing it done and that's it and the song's done and it's not it's not like it's not like the song is bad but it having Carly in the Universe and having the band and writing together and you know going through writing a million terrible verses and choruses until you get the one that you actually like is just 
that's like the fun of the writing process. So it's definitely something, definitely something like I think just more enjoyable, like mm -hmm. in terms of making and writing music. But you know, that's just my opinion, and some people love doing it the other way. Well, it lends itself to collaboration too, which is uh, I think important when you know when making music. Obviously, it's nice you know, to be trapped by yourself and, hey, this is my thing and this is all, these are all my ideas and whatever, but I think all the best music that I've made always, yeah, I'm not the only one involved, you know, there's other people, you know, striking a balance with you and, and, um, you can't off, think of everything. Yeah, you can't think of everything you, and, you, you know, you need somebody to keep you in check too. Yeah. I, I think uh, a team is always more powerful, especially mm -hmm. when, you know, we've been lucky to work with such amazing musicians and people um how many times do we all sit in a room and tell each other that we suck do it again do something else go on <laughs> you know that's not good enough start it from scratch you know we just pound each other over the head until we get it right well i, I wholeheartedly agree with those sentiments i think the uh the real disappointment for me in this pandemic putting aside all of the you know, human tragedy that has occurred over the last year, but the loss of human connection, the ability to sit in the same room and just have coffee and talk about anything. But when you get to the creative process, there's really something missing when you are trying to create from a distance or trying to create through Zoom or the phone or email. And uh, as you're saying, to, to be able to be in the same room and just pick up on that body language as you're maybe playing a chord or uh, pitching some lyrics or something, that, that little subtle body language that can communicate things in a way that can um, help you with your creative process without having maybe your feelings hurt or maybe having your feelings hurt. Maybe you need to have your feelings hurt. <laughs> you know, you need to you have do. that conflict. <laughs> Um, and Leave the ego at the door is what we say. <laughs> and I, I, I know I really miss being in other people's creative spaces when I'm doing these interviews. For example, if we were not in a pandemic, I would be with you right now in your studio. I love seeing where people create. And I think well, that when this that, is over, you're definitely coming by. <laughs> oh, I, I, I would love to. Yeah. And, um, and I would love to to play some of those instruments that you feature on the website. <laughs> they're just Definitely. Go they're gorgeous. But um yeah, you I know, think Mike we're all has... we're, we're all we're all suffering from that lack of connection. Yeah, it, it extends obviously just beyond like music too. You know, I was th saying like in the beginning everybody was on sort of, you know, more weirdly connected where everybody's oh checking in, you know, every other day and stuff like that. We stopped that so long. Uh, ago. But you know, now I can't sit on the Zoom. Right anymore. now, we're at a point where it's like we're. I feel even more isolated than you know when everything first hit because you know we're not you know still in touch, but it's like now you're missing that human connection. And you know, we were trying to fill that human connection with Zooms mm. and what, Are you, you know still doing Zoom checking in all the time. But yeah, now it feels even more more isolating than it was to me. Yeah, the Zoom fatigue is real. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I've I've had enough. I mean, I I love this what we're doing now, but the right. usual like, oh, let's instead of a phone call, let's do Zoom. I'm like, no, let's not. <laughs> let's just do Have a regular deals. phone call. <laughs> play, let's play games online together. So, oh, God. Torture. what are you do, what are you doing from a business standpoint to deal with the restrictions of the pandemic and continue operating? It's been, I mean, the entertainment industry has just been hit so hard. Um, I worked as a music supervisor for a music library and I ended up losing my job. Um, and then fortunately enough was able to make Moose Cat a full-time thing for me, um, which I never would have considered. Um, and it was kind of a really awesome jump for us, but we're, we're being pretty careful. I personally have asthma, so, um, we require two negative COVID tests the week of for people to come in. And uh, we have been able to record like full bands come in and spend a week in here, like busting out their albums and it's been fine. And, you know, these people are also like very worried and 
you know, want to be as cautious as possible. So having the two sounds like incredibly annoying to some people, but to some people that sounds like a huge safety net for them to kind of come and be able to be comfortable in this environment and not feel like they're going to get COVID, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, we uh, we're hoping to get vaccinated here pretty soon and get all this behind us. Yeah. No kidding. The, I, I can just imagine the feeling of musicians going there for a week to record and having this safe space that feels normal for the first time in so yeah. long. You just it's ignore it. It's like, it's nice. Ugh. Yeah. And so, I, you know, again, even, and we get to have like interaction with people. You know, I'm like, well, I was going to yeah. say, it's like, it's kind of interaction because I'm in this room like the entire time. Like, you know, you, in the control room you know usually the band comes in and we listen on the couch and it's you know somebody's in here and blah blah blah. but now it's like everybody's in the other room i may we may you know move the couch in there and they're just in there the other room i'm in here with the door open so i mean it's definitely nice to be making music but they're still i'm still missing a little bit of Mm. like the way it was but we're getting it done you know and and that we're happy for that definitely grateful to be doing it he recorded Um, he recorded this past weekend he's like oh i'm kind of nervous like covid blah blah and then he like finished the whole weekend and he was like oh that was so much fun i missed that so much (laughs) yeah it's been it's you know we had i guess when the lockdown sort of first lifted um we were really really busy for like a number of months um and now you know kind of with the cases going back up here in la to astronomical heights kind of everybody is like oh kind of pulled back a little bit even though we're still operating so it's you know more more remote stuff more just mixing but we've done Um, so much for our business this past year to kind of set set us up for when things do open back up that we're going to be kind of ready to take the plunge and push things forward um we opened up a virtual recording studio online and it lets artists from anywhere in the world you know you're you're tracking at home and you have a guitar that you directly plug in or a microphone that you directly plug in and you can send the stems to us and mike can sit with you during the session and and edit everything on the fly and also run it through our outboard gear here so you kind of have a bit of the studio um, access while you're anywhere in the world. Um, and it's really nice for people to run it through tape or for through plate reverb and, and that type of thing. And we've also just honestly, like most of the projects coming in are like mixing and mastering from artists everywhere in the world wow. um, that are kind of just recording at home. So did that happen in response directly to the pandemic or was that something you were working on already? We thought about it. <laughs> yeah, we we had the idea of having like sort of this online platform that could sort of open up, um, you know, more people to to Moose Cat. Um, so then, yeah, like when the pandemic hit, I was like, well, not not doing a lot right now. Let's, uh, you know, maybe put some time into into uh, into this. So yeah, we we were uh, we kind of built it, had a new website put together. Um, and sort of started pushing that the the virtual it's a real studio pain more. to like make a whole do like a whole back end for a website and store for the, all that stuff. It took us a long time. That's well, that's brilliant. I mean, ta- the businesses that are surviving and thriving, th- surviving and thriving, are the businesses that are able to pivot and recognize that need and right. how to uh, continue going despite those limitations. Um, and I, I love the concept of having multiple tests in a week to require, um, you know, that type of safety measure before they go into the studio. Then you have this safe space, but you also have this alternate business plan of doing things online and, and helping people throughout the world. As you may have noticed, there are great resources and advice mentioned in all our episodes. And for many of them, we actually collect all of these resources for you in one easy place. Our newsletter. You can go to dreampathpod.com slash newsletter to join. It's not fancy, just an email about each week's episode, featured artists, and resources to help you on your journey. Thanks. And now back to the interview. Do you envision 
over the next, let, let's say in 2022, things open up and there is no more pandemic. Um, do, do you envision that people are probably going to continue on this uh, online way to connect just because, I mean, you're in LA and just the, the commute time and all of the logistics, I think people are realizing that there isn't so much of a need to be there in person anymore. Um, and putting aside whether that's good or bad, uh, do you envision that things are actually going to go back to where they were after this pandemic? Absolutely. People okay. need people need to get out of their houses. You know, yeah. people need to go out and do things. People are going absolutely crazy inside. I am going absolutely crazy inside. <laughs> I want to go out and go and do things and pay to go and and do things for myself. And this is this is definitely, you know. So many people are writing at home right now. They're not doing anything else but writing, you know? Mm. And and they're going to come to us with their projects when they're ready and we're going to record them, you know? But we also um we also have like a publishing arm for our uh studio and we've been signing a lot of artists and working with like commercials and TV shows and movie trailers and kind of um having like a whole for us, like for the music industry and to be successful in the music industry, staying in one lane isn't isn't how you're going to be successful in the music industry. You need to have your hands dipped in multiple pots to s and at the end of the day, all that collectively is going to give you the paycheck that you're looking for. So, um, you know, the virtual studio, the recording studio, the publishing company, we're both in bands. Like all that collectively is like helping us, you know, move the needle. Yeah. Especially without touring, you know, and, and out without shows. I, I, but I think definitely those are, that will come back hard with a vengeance. You know, when the it's safe. shows, yeah. I mean, you know, people are still going to be wearing masks at shows, but they'll be, I think people are going to forget how, forget how to do social distancing when they're at a concert and have a couple tequilas <laughs> in them. I don't think that's going to be possible. <laughs> yeah as well, long as this new strain like isn't a big deal you know like the uh, the vaccinations people are gonna get vaccinated hopefully it's, soon here it's going to end at some point yeah. that's the, that's the main point and if and you don't want to get vaccinated you can stay home still yeah or that's get true. COVID. yeah yeah well i I, 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 I agree with mike i think we are going to see an end to this thing but i don't know that the end is going to look like the beginning. In other no. words, I think we're still going to, we're going to be changed dramatically. And I think people will be taking precautions for years in terms of wearing masks. And we may look sure. like, uh, you know, Asian countries have looked for the last two decades in terms of wearing masks just as a precaution, but in terms totally. of bringing, bringing people back together for live performances and things like that, I, I just don't see America, um, shying away from that they're going to come back to live performances because it is part of our it's just part of our ethos it's part of our dna we have to um be able to come together in in crowds like that and experience art and creativity happening right before us um and and i don't think that can be taken away from us even even in a pandemic, I mean, temporarily, yes, but we're eventually get to, we're going to get to a point where we're back doing those things and we're just going to have to figure out therapeutics and, um, you know, ways to deal with that safely. There, there will be ways. I, I think mean, we second... can rest assured there's going to be, it's going to come back. It just might maybe, you know, it's already taken longer than we hoped and it'll probably yeah. be longer than we think. And, um things will be different like probably a lot of less people may you know in the cities or whatever are the residual effects but i don't i think that yeah there's no way we we can't move we're not going to be watching live streams instead of you know going to coachella or whatever like there's that's not it's not part of human nature to right. <laughs> to adapt to that i don't yeah, think i hear you yeah so the um you know, what I'm, I'm curious about, I, I normally start with a more biographical arc, but both of you are musicians 
And Mike, I've I've seen your work on YouTube and I've listened to your uh, Young Creatures band and it looks like you do keyboards, hey. um, uh, guitar and vocals. And uh, Carly, I, I've seen your YouTube videos and listened to your music with Carly in the Universe. And I've seen you mainly as a vocalist. Do you play other instruments or... Uh, no. Yeah, your 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 <laughs> stage presence is incredible. By the way, oh, thank um, you. So very I much. Keep, keep up the great work. Thank Can you. Can you tell me, starting with Carly, how did you find music, and and what called you to becoming a singer in a band like Carly in the Universe? Funny enough, I nobody in my family really are musicians. So it, I didn't get the bug that way. I just loved singing so much. And I was singing around the house all the time. So my parents decided to throw me into singing lessons. And my singing teacher now is 98 years old. Wow. Um, she's incredible. She, her husband played for Ella Fitzgerald and Lena Horn, And she was the voice of like Ava Gardner in Showboat. Wow. Can you, can you um, give so her a shout had, out by name? Uh, her name's Annette Smith. Um, she still does lessons, you know, but she's um, very old. <laughs> 98, yeah. That's 98, incredible. But she's like the most spiritual, like awesome, loving, happy person. Um, so it's been like really great to work with her. And um, I guess like through her is kind of how I developed my sound and um, you know, Motown's always been my jam. Jazz music has always been my jam. Um, and uh, with Carly in the Universe, we've so you know the stuff that we're actually going to be releasing stuff this in April. Finally, oh, can't wait. Uh, we've been sitting on it for a little over a year, I guess, because with the pandemic and everything, we kind of delayed the release, and we were about to release it right during like Black Lives Matter movement. And I was like, nobody wants to hear a white girl. <laughs> releasing music during Black Lives Matter. I know my place. I'm going to go sit in the back and uh, wait a little bit. So yeah. I think, you know, 2021 is a, a better better time. I think uh, people do are a little bit more hopeful now. So I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, how about you, Mike? What was your trajectory as a musician? And how did you find uh, the young creatures as your, um, your band to uh, put out music? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, just from, I was always like a big fan of music growing up um, and started playing guitar when I was like 12 or 13. And um, basically from there, I was just trying to write songs and playing in bands. And pretty early on, like in high school in, the, in that process, I, I figured that uh, I really liked the idea of like recording at, you know, so that and that seemed like a more sort of realistic uh path to be you know involved in music um rather than just trying to be just an artist um it seems like maybe you know maybe i could make a living doing it so um and yeah i was just always very very passionate about it into it you know obsession absolute obsession with mm -hmm. recording <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah and then just started trying to you know moved out to LA and uh right out like three weeks after college and then just from there just spiraled out of control just trying to work with people and uh intern and assist and just try to you know set get into as many studios as I could um and then you know all along the way always writing songs and always um trying to do the more you know be on the artist side of things um as well so um yeah, and Young Creatures, um, we've been at it for a minute now and uh, just started as sort of like a collaborative project, um, at, you know, sort of a, a sound that I couldn't have come up with on my own. Um, then I also I also write, like, kind of a, have like a solo project as well, so. Oh, you got to check um, it out. It's pretty great. Thanks. Well, uh, I will definitely put all of those uh, links up on my show notes at the... Uh, uh, when, when this episode launches to make sure the listeners have access to all of your solo projects and, um, you. and, and your band as well. And, and anybody out there listening, if you've worked with terrible producers in the past, <laughs> people that are too cocky to, uh, you know, listen to your needs for your project or just skimped out on really making sure that your music sounds the best that it can, definitely check out Mike. 
He's an awesome producer. He listens to what you want. I've worked with I've worked with all the terrible people that are out there. I get it. I'm sure you're nervous to try somebody new, but this is the guy. He really cares about your project. <laughs> so always, sal- always selling. <laughs> I, I would be remiss if I did not ask about Alice Cooper and the Welcome to uh, My Nightmare album. The um, you know I saw your credits and I saw the Alice Cooper credit. And I started looking at um, the Alice Cooper discography, basically, and, and um, this guy is one prolific musician. But you you worked on the um, the follow up to the '76 yes. album that from t- yes, 2011, I was not alive. Right? I was not alive for the first right. one, although amazing <laughs> album. Yeah, so that was actually um, at another studio that I was assisting and engineering at, um, and yeah, I was. Just kind of thrown in the fire a couple days uh, with Alice and producer Bob Ezrin, um, you know, just sort of helping out on on those sessions. It's all super super nice guys. Alice was was a uh, very very kind to to me, even though I I was uh, you know sort of just making my way in the industry. Um, definitely an experience I I won't forget. That's for sure. Yeah. So. When you look at engineers and producers, both of you, uh, who have achieved, you know, uh, upper echelon success in the industry, who do you look to as inspirations? For me, it's pr- probably a pretty long list, you know, ranging from uh, producers and engineers, but also um, artists as well. I guess just off the top of my head, a guy like Sean Everett, who's an amazing producer and engineer who's very, very technical, but also has, um, amazing, uh, you know, musical, musical taste and, and, uh, and prowess. Um, somebody like, somebody like that, who's, who's, you know, maybe started more on the technical side of things, but, um, very creative in that, in that process. Um, so I really, I really like that sort of, uh, melding of, of both, both worlds of tech technicality but making it a creative art more so than just you know hit and record and you know try trying to i guess put push the envelope on that can you explain to my listeners the difference between engineering and producing sure yeah so i guess uh traditionally you know two different jobs um back in the day you know you have the engineer who's more of a technical you know getting getting the levels and hitting record on the tape machine and editing the tape if you know uh setting up microphones getting the sounds um choosing the microphones uh sort of that more technical side of things uh and then a producer you know traditionally is somebody who sort of oversees the process of the recording uh, it can be creatively or which is kind of turned into a very creative job. Uh, but even traditionally, you know, looking over the budget and choosing the studio, choosing the musicians. If it's, uh, let's say it's a singer songwriter, they may choose who the, the cast of characters around them and just sort of making sure that the whole process is streamlined and smooth and just, uh, but now, you know, that, that job has sort of become a bit more, um, elusive i I would say in terms of uh you know the the role that it plays it can play a variety of roles now um uh people who make the actual whole instrumental beat or a song you know is considered a producer now so um it can definitely have like a wide array but somebody who just sort of oversees the whole process whether it's just literally being like a fly on the wall and like there for support or somebody who's heavily involved in making the music and writing the music as well um so i tend to play both roles um i so there's yeah again a variety of ways that people do it to all sorts of uh all sorts of different ways and successfully in all sorts of different ways um but yeah Yeah. i guess i've adopted sort of a two-prong approach where you know i'm also i'm setting up i'm getting the sounds i know what sounds i want i'm choosing the mics i'm doing all the technical stuff but then also overseeing the whole process of recording 
Yeah. I, the, the way I look at producing, and, and I'm at, not in the industry at all, but just as a novice, I think of a producer as someone like Rick Rubin, who comes in and has this reputation that precedes him and this mystique around him. And then it just seems like whatever room he's in, whatever is going to be produced and recorded will have some of his magic dust <laughs> sprinkled on it. And I really don't know what that is, though, because I've listened to interviews with Rick Rubin, and I just don't know, is is there anything concrete that someone like Rick or uh, you know some of uh, the people that you look up to do as a producer to turn an album into something distinct and unique and something with their fingerprint on it? Yeah, I, you know, Rick is definitely unique um, in that he is just such a, you know, he doesn't come from a, a super musical background. He comes from like a fan perspective. So he, you know, he has a very unique perspective on it. You know, most producers are musicians or or engineers. So, and he doesn't come from come from that. So he sees sort of an artist in a different light. And he, uh, to me, he's more like, big picture and he can mm-hmm. see that sort of big picture for the artist you know and their trajectory of their career and you know where he where this record will fit in with that and all the other works um yeah. obviously a very special uh person um but yeah i would say he's even more of leans towards that tr- sort of traditional sense of a producer who's just sort of the guiding the guiding light or something like that right but yeah it is kind of hard to put your finger on um working with super yeah. talented musicians makes a big difference yeah to, oh that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah that that makes sense i but you know it's it's you know not everybody is that savant right and i would imagine too that in going back to moose cat and how producing works and how you interact as a producer with musicians at Moose Cat. Uh, those, those musicians come in with a certain level of uh, willingness to listen and collaborate and, or as, you know, Stop collaborate, collaborate and listen. Cl- yeah, I'm, I shouldn't have gone there. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, but th- it's, it's probably just a function of how much they're willing to listen and how much feedback they want and then how much of a, um, I guess a symbiosis there is between your what you can contribute and what they're willing to incorporate and sure. pull into their music. And a lot of it like is trust, you know. You kind of have to build that trust with with the with the artists, you know. You you don't go in guns a blaze and say, "Hey, you better change this 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 and this and do this and blah." You know, it's 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 a collaborative effort and, you know, definitely is built on trust, you know. Um mm-hmm. so the first time you're working with somebody, you know, I sort of tip, maybe tiptoe around a little bit more, see what's comfortable as far as, you know, what input is needed and what feels right and, and what doesn't feel right. So um, every, every sort of every project is a little bit different in that way. Right. But as far as my projects go and when he's producing my projects, I'm doing like 20 vocal takes of the same song and the same chorus over and over and over and over again. Oh, that was good. Let's get another take. <laughs> so we tend to be most... more more picky with our own right projects sometimes yeah, yeah. well that, that makes sense i mean you guys have a you, you've been working together for so long that you you have that inherent trust and uh yeah. that if, if he says another take that you really should do another take right it's not the just other torture one was good the other <laughs> one was good come on so out of all of the roles and, and lanes that you guys are in uh, what is what is your favorite place to be? Where what would you prefer to be doing most of the day in terms of being in the studio, working with other bands, uh, working online, helping with tracks that people send you, working in television and film and commercials and that type of thing? I know what she's gonna say. What? Just writing yeah. and uh, creating. Just sort of me. being in that sort of. Yeah, that like zone of like creativity. Mm -hmm. I like being an artist first and foremost. Yeah, you know, Uh, that makes sense. And you know, I love like for Carlin Universe, we 
shot like eight music videos over the pandemic that we're going to release. And I think that stuff is so fun, you know, getting dressed up, doing the shoots, writing the songs, recording the songs. Um, that's, that's the fun part for me. And hopefully that's, you know, couldn't be the, the biggest, uh, pot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I urge my listeners to subscribe to your channel because it's those videos Thanks. are are gorgeous. <laughs> Thanks, They're very well done. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. We got a bunch more coming out. Yeah, yeah it's it's just like being for me. It's like being in that zone, you know, sort of like the head rush that you get like when you're like performing live. Is but for me, it comes like in other forms too. Like sometimes I'm working on a mix, and I sort of get that like zone, in that zone thing where you're not thinking a whole lot but you're mm -hmm. just creating and i know it happens with writing too and you know i guess yeah the easiest way to say it is just like when you're performing live and you're like just in another you're not thinking about it and you're just doing it and it's just coming out and it's coming out great yeah so finding that flow state <laughs> yeah is where it's tough where to get it be. gets harder yeah. and harder to find it yeah it is i think with social media and the our, our attention spans being shortened and we're so scattered and, and also in a fight or flight response with uh, the political environment and everything that's been happening over the last four years. Um, it's hard to find that flow state and to do deep work, you know, deep focused, prolonged focus on, on important projects. Definitely. Um, yeah. So what advice would you both give to young people that are looking to get into the recording industry and uh, and and take the starving out of starving artists? Because it sounds like this is a <laughs> great way to make a living, but still be around and through osmosis, you know, um, be part of the creative process and also be able to fund your own creative projects. What advice would you give to them if you were in a room full of say high school seniors looking for this type of work? Yeah, I would say it's um, totally viable and possible. Um, but you gotta be like 150% obsessed with it. You know, it can't be a side thing. You got to be li literally living, drinking, breathing music and recording. And just every ounce of your energy needs to go towards learning about it, doing it, and just, you know, trial and error, basically. Um, I'm still, like, learning stuff all the time and trying to get better and better. So it's not a process that ever, that ever stops for me. And I would say for young people, like, just, you got to fully immerse yourself. You got to fully be committed to it and like kind of act as if like this is the only thing that you can do or that you want to do or that you will do. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it, it was sort of that way where I was like, you know, this is it. I don't know why one way or another I'm going to make it work. So you got to sort of have that attitude, I think. Otherwise, if you're like one foot in, one foot out, yeah, this seems kind of cool. You know, I could, you know. You'll get burnt know. out and you'll get disappointed and every door will be slammed in your face and you'll be told that you suck and <laughs> you'll be interning for no money and you can't pay rent and those are welcome to the club. You mm -hmm. know, like you can't, you can't complain that it's hard because it's hard for everybody that's wanting to be successful in this industry because it's so cutthroat, you know? Everybody wants to be doing this, you know, but you actually have to, you know, put every put everything into it to make it happen. Yeah, great and advice. Get lucky. And, and oh, and, and luck too. Then there's and have connections. <laughs> yeah. And have connections, sorry. Well, make connections, I would say. Both. So uh, immerse yourself, be ready for pain and suffering. <laughs> yes. Uh, network and find a community, it sounds like, and and hopefully get lucky. <laughs> That's not uh, too complicated too of a formula. To <laughs> but if you keep trying for a long time... The luck comes the chance... a lot more easily. Yes. Right. Yeah, th that makes a lot of sense. So you both have been so gracious to share your journey with me. 
and to uh, tell us about your studio and how you got into that space. Um, is there anything that you would like to share with the audience in terms of um, future projects that you're excited about and that you want to get them to pay attention to over the next few months or through uh, the end of 2021? Hit us up. We're excited to hop on calls with other artists, meet up. You know, we're we're both pretty down to earth people and uh, love to meet new people, love to build community here. We usually, with the pandemic, it didn't happen, but we put on these like very extremely large events with um, like this year we were going to have like Korg, Fox, Blue Microphones. Um, sponsor the event. Um, we work with like a water company called Liquid Death. We work with Earthquaker Devices, um, THC Design, a weed company, and they all come together. And we're all jamming, smoking, drinking, and just partying and eating a, too much food and having a good time. And it's always been great to build community here and get artists to really meet managers and A&R and other producers and that type of thing and labels and we're and each we, other yeah and, and each other and we just really want to like we we want anybody who comes in this studio to be successful with their work you know it sucks mm -hmm. to to spend all that time on your album and then you put it out and nobody listens to it we know we get that and we've been through it and uh you know uh we're we're happy to help people on their artistic journey and any advice that they need we're happy to help and nice. hopefully we can get back to that sort of human connection again soon um well, when that happens the meantime, i'm coming down i'm coming down for the food and the uh you're in and, man you're yeah. in come yeah <laughs> hopefully uh 2022 but yeah we'll i don't see. know that this year we're gonna no this year is probably out. i do like i make all the food and i do like a huge like buffet type style i'm like nobody's gonna want to eat buffet ever again <laughs> <laughs> that's true. buffets are gonna come back okay <laughs> right yeah. next to concerts Right. Right. Yeah. Well, it was a pleasure talking to both of you. You as well. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always... Go find your dream path.